from Goring. So, uh, speaking a little bit about uh, laser science, uh, our managing director, Dr. Lalit Kumar, after uh, completing his PhD from IIT Mumbai, uh, he started this company in 1988. And uh, we are proud to say that Corent was the first company who joined their hands and showed trust in us. Since then, uh, today we are representing uh, more than 20 companies uh, from all over the globe who are uh, the pioneers in uh, research instruments and uh, research instruments uh, related to lasers like scientific and industrial lasers, spectroscopy and microscopy equipments, thin film deposition systems, fiber processing tools, imaging systems, and diagnostic systems as well. Uh, we are, uh, now I will... Uh, uh, like uh, like to ask uh, Mr. Jagdish to give an introduction of our speaker. Thanks. Thank you, Ankit. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thanks for joining this third webinar session. I also take this occasion to thank the entire marketing team, Ankit Apeksha, for doing this webinar in a very short notice. So it has been always a very immense pleasure to introduce the speaker today, uh, Dr. Mark Origoni. I've been interacting with him for several years, and every time I listen to him, he fascinates me uh, with his updated knowledge on the current trends of laser applications. Uh, I'm sure this today's talk is also going to be an enlightening one for everyone. I'm very eager on that. Uh, just to mention about Dr. Mark Origoni, uh, he received his master's from Politecno di Milano in 1984. He worked briefly in a FIR, uh, an Italian company, uh, dealing with defense and aerospace products. And he joined Coren in 1988 as an R&D engineer. And gradually he moved in all different levels, took the various roles, and escalated himself as a director of segment marketing and strategic marketing in 2007. In this position, he was very much instrumental in doing a lot of market analysis for several Corin products and its subsequent launches. Dr. Arigoni has many publications and patents to his credit. He has written several white papers on cutting edge products. He is well known in the international community. He attends of various conferences. He is the author for many different articles in the laser magazines. Uh, once he was, uh, we had the privilege of having him in India for the Bangalore Microscopic course, where he gave us such an excellent lecture here. So without taking much time, uh, I invite Dr. Marco Origini to give his talk as we are all eager to listen to him. And just a quick note, I think uh, there's a message also in the chat box. Please raise your questions in the chat box along with your name and email ID. We will try to get back with the queries answered at the end of the talk. And in case we miss you, we'll make sure you are sending you an email uh, answering your clarification. And over to our speaker now, Dr. Arigori. Thank you very much, Jagadesh. You've been uh, too kind with your introduction. And uh, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, and greeting, greetings from California. Uh, you say that, let me share my screen and uh, uh, I will, uh, uh, Jagadesh, I will ask you a confirmation that the screen is actually uh, yes. visible. Yes, yeah, please okay. go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, let me, let's start. Let me get a laser pointer here. Okay, so. Um, today's presentation is about ultra-fast lasers and especially their applications. And uh, um, I divided more or less in four ultra-fast laser and amplifiers, a, a lightweight introduction, I would say, is more to put in the context of the applications. Uh, and understand how perform. I will dedicate I will dedicate quite some space to talk about uh, um, nonlinear imaging, specifically multi-photon microscopy areas, because uh, multi-photon microscopy is really one of the biggest market for uh, femtosecond lasers. I will, of course, 
talk also about other application of mod lock laser, like terahertz generation, for example. And then uh, the last part of the talk uh, will be dedicated to uh, a number of um, application of ultra fast laser amplifiers. So applications where a substantial amount of energy per pulse is required. Um, and uh, having said that, I would like first to give you a brief uh, bird view of the scientific market, uh, scientific uh, market in, in uh, uh, of lasers. So, coarsely speaking, is divided in three categories: uh, continuous wave lasers, uh, picosecond, femtosecond, that is ultra fast laser, and then nanosecond type of laser, like we use which solid state or eczema laser, the way we observe it at coherent. And specifically, our reading is that application uh, with pulse nanosecond laser are relatively flat. Uh, it's a well studied area. Uh, well, we see upward trend, uh, both in studies with CW and especially with sharp pulse lasers. And what is the reason for that? For CW, because there is interest determined by life sciences, for example, and of course, uh, quantum technology that require narrow line with CW lasers. Uh, femtosecond is extremely dynamic because there are a lot of applications in terms of spectroscopy, terahertz generation, and so on. So it's a very dynamic area. And of course, multifactor imaging, especially for neuroscience. So um, since I promised that I'm going to talk a little bit about the laser technology here, I want to put in context the performance of ultra fast lasers with respect to other uh, event or phenomena in nature. You see here, for example, fluorescence is typical on nanotechnology scale. Fast transistors can react uh, or control current on a picosecond scale. And there is nothing really in technology pulses. Now, this domain is very important because that is the domain of molecular vibrations. And as we go towards even shorter pulses, attosecond pulses, this is basically electron motion or the, or the motion of electronic wave packet in, in atoms. And uh, here you see, as an example, a 32 femtosecond pulse, which is a sort of a nowadays standard for a high-end performance titanium sapphire amplifier. So perfectly suitable to address all these um, uh, time resolution domains. Now, mod lock laser are typically operated in the tens or hundreds of megahertz. They can produce as short as 10 femtosecond pulses and their peak power uh, is on the order of a megawatt, I would say. Um, there are situations where you need higher energy per pulse and the way to do is to scale down the repetition rate, amplifying these pulses and this way is possible to achieve uh, easily the gigawatt uh, region. Of course, you can achieve also the terawatt region or even more, but uh, here you're talking about the custom laser, very large and with very low repetition rate, like one shot per minute, for example. While here we are talking about uh, a repetition rate that enable uh, most experiments in a laboratory. Now, how do you generate mod lock pulses? Um, or the femtosecond pulses. Uh, the technology is the so-called mod locking. It's called like this because the main, the main locking together a large number of modes that oscillate in the resonators. Now these modes are determined by a certain relatively easy relationship, so which is an uh, integer number of wavelength um, are supported, uh, must be supported in a round trip in the resonator. Now, uh, of course, there is a large number of modes that are possible. Here you see a simplification where you see, for example, in a resonator with 21 oscillations, 22 and so on. Uh, of course, this wavelength would be very long if they were in the optical domain. Um, the interesting thing is that when you can lock together a number of modes, like you see in this animation, the larger the number of modes, at a certain point you obtain a pulse which and you see here that it circulates in the cavity back and forth. And interestingly enough, you see that when this pulse is at the end of the cavity is when boom, all the modes here go to zero. They have uh, at that point, uh, they go through, through the, the uh, zero electric field. So uh, this is the typical situation where you have this pulse circulating with a certain uh, periodicity. So this is 2L over C and this is on the order of 10 to 100 megahertz. Now, uh, 
uh, at this point, we know that a pulse circulate, circulate with a certain repetition rate is a short pulse, but uh, we don't know yet how we get this pulse practically and also what is the pulse duration. So let's look first at what is, what is the pulse duration. And, uh, um, oh, sorry, how we actually, we, we get uh, uh, the pulse path of the pulse. Uh, you see that a way is to enable uh, low losses only when this pulse uh, is in transit. And, and this is done putting, for example, a modulator close to the end of the cavity. This could be an acoustic optic or an electro-optic modulator and modulating it at a frequency that matches the cavity around trip is possible to enable this mode locking regime. Even more simply, this can be done with so-called saturable absorber. Those can be real or can be uh, artificial, so to speak, uh, playing some trick. Uh, one of them is the so-called care lens mode locking trick, uh, so which is putting, for example, an aperture in the cavity. And, uh, and this enable to lock together modes and generate these pulses. Now, what about the duration of these pulses? Uh, and the answer is that there is, of course, a relationship between the bandwidth that you can lock together and the duration of the pulses that are supported. So here I want to give an example with a very broadband laser oscillator based on titanium sapphire technology. Uh, this oscillator has a bandwidth of 125 nanometer. This corresponds to about 35 terahertz. And if you look that uh, uh, the, the free spectral range is about 100 megahertz, you see that the, the gain line width of titanium sapphire would be able to support in this resonator something like 350,000 moles. Um, now, you cannot lock maybe all of them, but still it's possible to lock a uh, large number so that you get qu quasi transfer limited pulses that are about 10 femtoseconds. So the lesson here is that the larger is the bandwidth, the shorter is the pulse duration that can be generated. Playing some trick in the extreme case is possible to generate with titanium sapphire laser pulses that are as short as five or six femtoseconds. Now what you see here in this uh, table is a set of typical parameters for a broadband with uh, titanium uh, lasers. Now, this is just one of the ma many type of uh, mode lock oscillators. Here I summarizing uh, four types. One is the broadband, extremely broadband titanium sapphire version. Another one is a less extreme version where the pulses are longer and these actually enable tunability. So in this case, you see a laser that can be tuned by about 400 nanometers. So here the main advantage is not necessarily high peak power or short pulses, but is the capability to tune over the near IR. Um, at the same time, and a little more recently than, than types of lasers, uh, there was an emergence of, uh, emergence of other technology based in fiber or in bulk, like terbium or erbium fiber lasers. Those generate slightly longer pulses, are not tunable at all, they're fixed wavelength, but they can scale, be scaled up in power to 20 watt level. Now, if tunability is required to, to uh, an iterbium laser and, uh, and achieve this way uh, one box tunable laser that has even broader tuning range than what is allowed by titanium sapphire, in this case, you you see that is actually one octave of tuning uh, range. Uh, now, uh, here, as you see, a common trait is that the repetition rate is about uh, uh, 50 to 100 megahertz, and this might be too high for some experiments. The tuning range is, is an octave, but is limited still to the near IR, and uh, some experiment in vibrational spectroscopy require longer wavelength than that. And finally, the energy per pulse is in the order of tens, maybe hundreds of nanojoules. And again, this peak power might be too low for some nonlinear studies. And so what's the answer to all these uh, missing elements? Uh, the answer is amplification. Can we amplify these pulses to, to higher energy than these hundreds of nanojoules? And we are going to look briefly into that. Just would like to be, do a quick check, uh, Jagadesh, is the audio okay? Uh, this is perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so this is an interesting and historical pictures of Gerard Moreau and uh, his student, Donna Strickland, which actually have the pleasure to, to know personally. Uh, they invented uh, a very momentous technique that enabled 
the amplification of femtosecond pulses in 1985, and they were rewarded for these with the Nobel Prize in 2018. Now, um, the simply put, uh, the, the issue here is that you cannot amplify lasers from a model of oscillators above a certain energy because you would destroy the material, because the energy of the pulses or the peak power would be too high to be sustained in the titanium sapphire rod or in you know, that they took was to stretch the pulses. So, so something like hundreds of picosecond, amplifying these pulses when they're long so that the peak power is more reasonable and then compressing uh, these pulses uh, after the amplification. And, uh, and you see these in this block diagram where you see a mod lock titanium sapphire amplification, the stretcher, usually with a grating, uh, the amplification stage and the compression compression with another grating. Uh, and since it's titanium sapphire, you need a green pump laser on both sides. Now, a uh, similar implementation is uh, employed uh, for a megahertz type of fiber laser, for example, based on Iterbium. Uh, the difference is that uh, all the stages are in fiber and uh, the pulses are selected or down selected using uh, optic modulators that can be also in fiber. So in a case like this, the only element which is not in a fiber is the final compressor. And, and this really changes a little bit the paradigm of the overall lasers. And I can give you an example of that here. So this is a modern amplifier, one box amplifier uh, with the various element. And here you see that uh, you have uh, the model lock laser with the pump here integrated. You have uh, the, uh, I apologize for that backward. Uh, you have the stretcher and the compressor that are sealed in this box uh, and the, the pump laser for the amplifier, which is another green Q-switch laser here. And finally, the amplification module, which is on this platform here. Now, uh, this is actually a coherent laser we name Estrella. And this type of laser uh, navigates very well the, the regime of titanium sapphire lasers that you see here in this chart uh, where you have repetition rate and energy per pulse. So the optimum space for titanium sapphire amplifiers is in the region of uh, uh, several millijoules and repetition rate between 1 and 10 kilohertz. Here in gray you see the space of the alternative technology which is Iterbium. And as you see here, the domain here is higher repetition rate and lower energy per pulse. Now with the uh, use of, um, of fiber lasers, uh, the terbium fiber laser, it's possible to decrease substantially the dimension of the package. Here you see a comparison at the same scale of laser and iterbium amplifier that produces 60 watts. So you get 60 watts versus 9 or 10 watts in a much smaller package. And here again, you see how all the elements that I showed before in a previous slide are in just this box here, inclusive of the compressor at the end. Um, so again, comparing the two technology, you know, some of the question, question that comes also from our customers is what, what, what should I buy? What's best for, for my experiment? Or, or if I want to do a multiplicity of experiment? And the answer is still relatively straightforward. Uh, a titanium sapphire has the best performances in terms of energy per pulse and also short pulse duration, you know, as short as 25 femtosecond for millijoule pulses. Well, in the case of Iterbium fiber, especially fiber laser, uh, the domain is higher power, 40 to 100 watts, extremely flexible repetition rate from single pulse to 50 megahertz. So they are very efficient in terms of cost per watt. Now, the, the downside are the pulse duration are longer. And as I mentioned, the energy per pulse is more limited. Now, I have to say that use of crystals rather than fiber alleviates some of these limitations. So with crystal it's possible to get, for example, shorter pulses, but you lose some of the flexibility. Now let's try to put a little bit uh, the, the various type of amplifier or, or lasers I described before in the context of the application. And I like to split the application in four. Uh, one is imaging, especially for life science. Uh, another one is a physical chemistry, so a lot of pump and probe experiment. Uh, 
Then we go into what I call applied physics, where you have strong field, uh, laser plasma acceleration, terahertz generation, and then you have material studies and modification, where you use the femtosecond laser either for ablating material, which is very important in the industry, especially in semiconductor industry, um, or for studying uh, property of materials themselves, like uh, photoelectron emission spectroscopy. Now, these various applications uh, are better served by different types of systems. So, for example, titanium sapphire amplifiers are perfect for physical chemistry or applied physics where high energy is required, while material studies can be conducted more efficiently with high repetition rate amplifiers. So, with this brief introduction, I want to start a deep a little uh, more in detail into applications of femtosecond laser oscillators. Here you see a table, and I will go into some of those. I'm listing multi-photon imaging uh, or nonlinear imaging, a terahertz domain spectroscopy, generation of supercontinuum and comb, uh, pump and probe, entanglement stabilization. Now, in the few slides, in the in the next slides, I will focus uh, considerably on multi-photon imaging because of its relevance, and I will touch on time domain spectroscopy and on entanglement studies. Uh, the reason I selected this is because I will discuss more in detail pump and probe and CEP stabilization on the amplifier side because that is more the domain of, of amplified, amplifi uh, amplified systems. So multi-photon microscopy um, for I don't know if how many of you are familiar uh, with life science and neuroscience, uh, but I will give you a very brief introduction uh, to multi-photon microscopy, starting with scanning microscopy, which can be single photon as well. And scanning microscopy, as the name said, is uh, uh, basically moving a laser beam using uh, scanning along X and Y direction with Galvo scanners, and in doing so, describing a pattern uh, back and forth on the image on the sample and creating an image. Now, uh, moving the objective of the microscope is possible actually to image several planes and, and, and therefore synthesize a, a three-dimensional image of the sample. Now, this is done taking advantage of the fluorescent that is into the sample. And the way it's done here is you see a typical single wavelength CW laser in a fluorescent probe here, you see the, the laser, the beam is generated on the focal plane, but also before and after. So this is a one photon excitation. You see here typically very small lasers uh, used for, uh, and also relatively inexpensive use for this process. On the other hand, you can excite the same fluorescence in a two photon modality using two photon from a femtosecond laser. And here you see the dramatic difference. Here you have still the one photon excitation. And if you look here, the two photon excitation, you see that there is light, is the little dot here at the center of the green circle, and there is no excitation uh, before or after. And just because of the selectivity and the non-linearity of the two process. So here, this, uh, the two photon excitation gives you uh, a naturally actually uh, white tunable laser. Here you see an example of many different uh, uh, fluorescent probes, uh, and you see that in a two photon regime, they are excitable in a variety of wavelengths from 700 nanometer, even less than that, up to 1.2 microns. And this speaks about the need for tuning the laser. Now, uh, multi-photon microscopy is over 30 years old. We celebrated that a, a couple of years ago at uh, Photonics West here in San Francisco. Here on this chart, you see some of the milestones, and I will not go through them. I will just uh, uh, emphasize a couple of them in laser technology. So we have now over 22 years since uh, one box tunable Tyson lasers were developed specifically for multi-photon microscopy. Fast forward about 12 years, and the first uh, iterbium uh, fiber pumping uh, OPO and all put into a box were put on the market. And uh, you go even past that, and uh, if you look at our laser, our flagship laser for uh, multi-photon microscopy in 2019, so in about 18 years or 17 years, we ship 3,000 of those lasers. And this gives an idea on how popular is multi-photon microscopy. At the same time, we started introducing single wavelength laser, and I will go into some more detail why these are important. 
So there are two souls, I would say, in multiphoton microscopy. And after the initial approach, when it was used for a lot of images that did not really require multiphoton imaging, there was relatively quick a settling on two main areas, a study of diseases and advanced neuroscience. And why is that? Here, I want to give you an example, a pictorial example of what, why neuroscience. Uh, here you see an image of a, a mouse brain after the skull is removed and a window is placed on the mouse, which is alive uh, and, uh, and behaving. And you see images of the neuron in the cortex. Now, this is just one of the animals that can be used for new modeling in neuroscience. The others you see are here, a fruit fly, the worms elegance, easy to study. It has only 302 neurons and all of them are classified. So it's a perfect model and simple model. Mouse, of course, is similar to humans. Zebrafish is fully transparent, so actually it's a very convenient model. And why fruit fly? Because it multiplies very quickly and is inexpensive, actually, and still has 300,000 neurons. So we have model animals that are recognized uh, in the academic world. And what are the probes here? The interesting thing here is that you have probes, fluorescent probes for imaging here. For example, you see pictorial uh, images of neurons but you have also probe to measure the activity of the neuron and even to stimulate the activity of the neurons, the so-called opsin in the so-called part of neuroscience, which is called optogenetics. And I will go into some more detail later on. Now, the other soul of multiphoton microscopy is disease studies. And here you see some images. For example, you see an image of a tumor invasion in tissue. Here you see another image of a biopsy compared with the typical histopathology that is done in most cases. So the idea is, can we push multiphoton microscopy and make it become uh, an aid during a surgery, for example, a, a, a brain cancer surgery, or as a fast tool for optical histology in, in place of commercial. Uh, so this needs, of course, to be exercised on human patient and sometimes in vivo. And so there are limitations. Uh, a major limitation is that you cannot use genetic expression and you cannot use many dyes. So you actually you can use only two intrinsic uh, fluorescent um, molecules that are present in, in our bodies, FID and NADH. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Let's now move on the probes for neuroscience. Now on this front, a major step forward was the introduction uh, of green fluorescent protein that was extracted from actually from a seaweed. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, this was done in 94 by Martin Chalfi and others. And this resulted in a Nobel Prize in 2008 to the same team. And uh, to give an idea of the flexibility of this approach and how it multiplied in a variety of different probes extracted from different species, here you have a petri dish where the team of Roger Cien at UC San Diego used different genetic expression on bacteria uh, to demonstrate how many colors you can have by various modification of these probes. Here is an example applied to real neuroscience. So neurons um, stained in a random way in four different uh, combination of probes. And this is the so-called brainbow. And here we move one step forward. This is actually, um, it's, uh, for some reason, I cannot get the animation going. Let me see here. Um, this is actually um, it, the activity of neurons. The neurons are supposed to be flashing because the probes that are expressed are actually sensitive to calcium and to, specifically to the concentration of calcium, which um, uh, it becomes brighter when there is an electric stimulus generated in the neuron. So the calcium is actually one of the way that current are uh, transmitted into the neurons. And uh, so I apologize here that I cannot get this animation uh, working now before it was before we started the webinar, but you would see the flashing of various neurons here. So I can nevertheless give you a pictorial representation of that. Here you see actually a recording of this neuro, of the fluorescence. When it gets higher, this can be recorded as a stronger signal. So what you see here is the fluorescence from a collection of neurons that are marked here, like one, three, four. And so this is what is called the recording of neural activity. So with the animation, uh, I don't know exactly what to do. Um, 
uh, Jagadesh, what do you think? Should I try to restart the slide or we can do without? Uh, oh, we can go ahead, uh, Marco, because I think sometimes in Zoom this happens. Okay, uh, okay, uh, all right. Okay, I will describe what was in this. Uh, here it's, it's um, an example of how you implement this recording of neurons. Uh, this was invented by David Tank at Princeton in 2007. The idea was to put a mouse with the brain uh, uncovered uh, and with a small glass window sealed on the brain to maintain the mouse alive. And in fact, this, this mice remains alive for months and months. Is put on a styrofoam ball so that the mouse actually can imagine or believe that he's moving around and directing, uh, moving and choosing where, which direction to go and if to go or stop. And uh, for example, uh, visual stimuli like uh, patterns can be projected on a screen. And uh, at the main time, the, the mouse uh, can move responding to stimuli, can be visual, can be sound, could be smell. And with a microscope, you can measure the activity of the neurons. Now, one step uh, further is actually to shine light on the neurons and replace the stimuli uh, that can be ol olfactory or auditory directly uh, acting on the neuron uh, so that the, the mouse believes that he's seeing something. And, and this is the video here that unfortunately I can show uh, I cannot uh, get in action, but there is actually a fiber uh, bringing blue light on the mouse. This is not multi-photon, it's confocal, it's single uh, photon. But when the blue light is flashing, uh, the mouse believes that he's thirsty and he will run to this plate where there is water and will actually drink water. Uh, so this is uh, an incredible example of uh, optogenetic triggering of stimuli in, in animal. Oh, actually, we can, you can see that here. So we are lucky. Uh, light, the light now is there. You see the mouse goes to drink. And uh, when the light is turned off, uh, the mouse will stop. Oh, okay, there you go. Stop drinking, go somewhere else. So this gives an idea of the power. Now, um, I mentioned before uh, the need for tunable laser, but it's also interesting to note that a lot of research in neuroscience, or the type that you saw just now with the mouse, is done actually using probes that are concentrated on two specific wavelengths. Anything that comes from green fluorescent protein, and this includes calcium indicators, is excited around 920, the so-called red fluorescent protein, so red shifted probes, is excitable optimally around 1100 nanometers or a, li a little shorter. So this uh, leads to a simplification where rather than using a tunable laser, you can use actually a couple of lasers uh, at single wavelengths. And here is an example of that. Reducing the wavelength to a single wavelength is possible to decrease the size of the laser and with this also the cost of the laser. And this has important implication for application also, uh, for example, to, to um, study or intra-operational intra aid, aid where you want to have a small laser, maybe on a cart in the operating room. Now, um, let's go to the more advanced aspect of neuroscience here. Uh, the, the rule of the game is to image wider area on the brain, to go deeper in the brain throughout all the cortex, maybe down to the hippocampus, and faster, studying many neurons, possibly a video rate or in a time frame, which is the same time frame of the reaction of neurons, so tens of milliseconds. And there are a variety of methods to, to address these. Uh, every year there is a new one coming. I'm going to focus on three because they're very laser intensive and, uh, and uh, I think they are so very smart approaches actually. The first one I want to discuss is a three photon imaging where in place of using two photon to excite the same probes, you can use three photons at longer wavelength. So in place of 920 nanometers, you can use 1.3 microns. The advantage of this is an even increased since it's sp spatial selectivity and because of the longer wavelength also a deeper penetration. And you see an example here of how deeper you can go using three photon imaging versus two photon imaging, even at the same wavelength, even more so if it's a shorter wavelength, like a conventional 920 nanometer. So the, the initial um, Paladin inventor of this technology was actually Chris Shue at Cornell in 2014. 
Uh, another technology I mentioned uh, uses optogenetics and is the stimulation of a large population of neurons. You can stimulate individual neurons that you can select in an arbitrary way. And you can do that using a, a special, um, an SLM, special light modulators, and uh, um, basically creating a pattern that on the image plane will split the beam from the laser in a multiplicity of beam, each one of them addressing an individual neuron. The other technology I want to mention is a very fast, uh, almost video rate interrogation of thousands of neurons. This has been also developed by uh, Professor Basiri, a Rockefeller in New York. The approach here is basically to use a single laser pulse per neuron and being able to scan the laser so rapidly that uh, you can actually um, scan an image in, in, uh, with thousands of neurons at repetition at, at a frame rate of 3 to 10 hertz. And here is an example of addressing thousands of neurons. Now, what these techniques have in common is that they drive longer wavelength, drive longer wavelength like 1.3 micron here or here for 3 photon, or 1 micron for the stimulation of this opsin. They also drive higher energy. Uh, and why is that? Because uh, uh, triphoton is a highly nonlinear process, so you need higher peak power or high energy. Here, because you split the beam over many neurons, so you need to have more energy per pulse to, to start with. And what this means is that you need to have laser amplifiers. And believe it or not, these type of applications are satisfied by terbium amplifier producing uh, uh, average power up to 40 watts and repetition rate of megahertz, up to 10 megahertz. So the small boxes I was mentioning before. And you see some of these domain in this slide here, uh, where you see repetition rate of kilohertz or uh, megahertz to 10 megahertz, and energy per pulse of uh, tens to hundreds of microjoules. So believe it or not, these researchers put something like 10 watts or 20 watts in the mouse brain, but this happens only for a few milliseconds because it's, a, it's a basically a flashing uh, of light on the neurons. So this concludes um, the aspect of advanced neuroscience. And I would like briefly to go to the application that could uh, move uh, to the pathology or to the operating room. The advantages here are, for example, for intraoperative uh, real-time guidance. For H&E, histology replacement is the faster sample processing where you don't need that actually to do the staining, which is quite labor intensive at time intent. What's the problem? There are still limitations on a patient when you're operating it. So the way to mitigate that is to use a variety of uh, methods at the same time. For example, lumping together two photon imaging, three photon imaging, second and third harmonic generation, and even coherent Raman. So this is called multimodal imaging. And if you are interested in that, uh, one of the research I really admire a lot is Steve Bopper uh, in Urbana, Illinois. And there are also a lot of very bright people working at this, like Melissa Scamalo Groth in the Netherlands. And just to give you a flavor of what's happening here in this progress towards uh, uh, the operating room, uh, Steve Bopart has this system uh, that is uh, it's called SLAM. It's a simultaneous label-free autofluorescent multi-harmonic microscopy, where basically a single wavelength laser, an italium laser, is a broadening spectrum with a fiber. It's shaped to limit uh, the wavelength to the important one. And this way you can actually act uh, on three processes at the same time. Here you see some of the paradigms uh, required for optimal excitation of FID and NIDH and also second or third harmonic generation. A similar approach using a single wavelength laser is by Amazi Periasami in uh, University of Virginia. He's doing fluorescent lifetime imaging and at the same time uh, multi-photon modality on the same fluorophore that are naturally present in, uh, in the human body and especially in tumor cells and indicate the metabolic level of the, of the cancer using a single wavelength laser at 780 to 800 nanometers. And in parallel, there are already companies or, or, or even academic starting their company making lasers uh, that are actually uh, in a one box or ready to 
go in an operating room or close to that, uh, these, these hopes. Uh, this, and, and this is a startup of Professor Rignol in France, uh, where he's developing actually endoscopy for nonlinear uh, non uh, microscopy, uh, including also CARS and SRS. So as a first summary here uh, of multiphoton, um, I would say two photon provides penetration, single cell resolution and sectioning that you cannot achieve with any other method, like for single photon confocal microscopy. Three photon further expand the imaging depth and selectivity. Uh, four three photon and other uh, high and technology dimension, uh, there is a need for higher Uh, the other application of, of uh, multi-photon, oh, uh, sorry, of modular laser, uh, one is terahertz generation. Uh, this is important because it can be used uh, uh, to interrogate sample in the terahertz region where it's possible to measure properties that are otherwise not uh, easily accessible. Uh, so this is an example of a uh, uh, time domain uh, femtosecond spectrometer in terahertz. Now, you can use this also for imaging. Uh, this is an example of looking at a, a defect, so an air bubble in the form of a car dashboard, actually. And uh, um, uh, so this is basically is a raster scanning of, of uh, spectroscopy and, and creating an image uh, on various pixels of the sample. Now, how you generate terahertz with a model of oscillators? Uh, the most common way is to use an antenna is a so-called low temperature growth gallium arsenide antenna. If you use a femtosecond pulse from a titanium sapphire laser or a fiber um, erbium laser frequency doubled, you can separate um, char uh, the carriers. And uh, since there is a bias voltage applied to, to uh, this uh, semiconductor, the recombination of the carriers generate actually a terahertz pulse. This is a fast, this is a picosecond process. And here you have an idea what you can generate with various pulse duration. You can generate a spectrum that covers typically peaks of one or two terahertz. And uh, uh, you see here the relative amplitude of that. So this is typically used for, uh, uh, for time domain spectroscopy. Um, this is an example of that, a terahertz pulse uh, is sent on a sample and here you measure the, and by doing a Fourier transform, you can measure the terahertz spectrum without the sample and the terahertz spectrum in transmission after the sample. And you can measure both the amplitude uh, and also the spectral uh, frequency. So that gives you information both on the refractive index and on the absorption of the sample in the terahertz regime. Um, for time, I guess I better speed up a little bit, so I will skip on uh, on uh, some other detail here on the second part. Um, I just want to give a brief flavor on entanglement studies. This is important for quantum communication. And uh, again, uh, titanium sapphire oscillators are used uh, for these. They are used specifically to generate um, in a parametric crystal a couple of photos that are naturally entangled because of the parametric generation process. Now, by strongly attenuating this couple of pulses uh, to a point where a single, statistically, a single couple of photon, pair of photon is uh, emitted by the parametric uh, crystal, these photons are entangled and it's possible to study them uh, by sending them on two different arms, uh, for example, of a, a Michelson interferometer. Now, these are studies, but this type of uh, quantum uh, communication is actually already happening. Here you see a picture of a payload uh, developed by the Chinese for their satellite issues. And of course, it doesn't use types of lasers, but it uses actually 850 nanometer vexel operating at 100 megahertz repetition rate. Um, 
Now with this, I would like now to move uh, towards uh, amplifiers. And uh, again, here we cover this space that I highlighted in, in blue. So I will touch briefly on a variety of uh, applications, starting with pump and probe, uh, then moving to sound frequency generation, up in complexity to two-dimensional spectroscopy, the pump and probe side of terahertz, uh, and then uh, high harmonic generation and attosecond physics. Now, before doing that, I just would like to uh, focus on uh, on amplifier, what amplifiers are available on the market. I, so far, I mentioned titanium sapphire and I mentioned also fiber amplifiers. Uh, these are the space where coherent operates. Now, it's important also to mention that there are alternative technology. For example, uh, ethereum can be in bulk, so uh, in a crystal or can be in a slab or in a disk. Uh, these are European company, for example, Trumpf and Amphos, specializes in, uh, in extremely high-end amplifier producing hundreds and hundreds of watts uh, for uh, typically for pumping system in high energy physics. Um, so some of these uh, format actually enable to scale the energy to the millijoule regime, while the fiber is more uh, at home in the hundreds of, of microjoules, as you can see here. Importantly, uh, applications related to research benefit usually from higher energy per pulse, except from imaging, where, as I mentioned before, 50 microjoules are sufficient. In industry, there is hardly the need to have uh, more energy per pulse than 200 uh, microjoules. And the reason is that at that point you are above the ablation threshold of materials. And so the rule of the game is to go faster more, rather than giving more energy. So there is a sort of bifurcation in the application space if it's industry versus research. Now with amplifier also, there is the issue of tuning. Uh, amplifiers are not tu uh, tunable like an oscillator is because it would be complex or because some media are not tunable like Ethereum. So the idea is to add a so-called parametric amplifier after the amplifier. And with this, it's possible to tune from about 200 nanometers to something like 20 microns. You want to go outside that, there are other approaches, uh, and I will discuss these later on, like uh, extreme UV um, generation or high harmonic generation or terahertz uh, through uh, so-called optical rectification. So uh, this is actually a summary of the, of the various type of pump and probes and the, the only reason I add it is to say that a lot of what I'm going to discuss is pump and probe, even if it doesn't show up in the name, actually. But uh, uh, let's therefore look at the fundamental of pump and probes. Here you see a typical situation where you use a relatively powerful pump, femtosecond pump uh, pulse from the laser to excite the sample to an electronic level or an excited vibrational level. And at that point, uh, with a probe beam, you want to study uh, how the uh, sample react. So you study the, the, the physical, the physics of the excited states. And the typical setup is like this. You have a laser, one arm of the laser produces the pump beam, and there is an optical delay la line so that you can delay uh, the, the arrival of the pump. And some of the energy of the laser is actually diverted and is used to generate white light in a crystal. And this typically is the probe beam uh, that is used to probe the sample. And here you see the typical spectrum. Here uh, in this spectrum, a certain sample, doesn't matter what it is, is, uh, um, is the, uh, illuminated with a pump beam and then by the probe beam a different delay on a picocycle scale. And also the resulting could be the transmission or can be the reflection or can be some other property is measured as a function of the wavelength. And you typically obtain a graph like that that you can dissect in many different ways. Now, these type of pump and probe setups are built by a researcher or can be purchased. Here is an example of these type of devices uh, by a small company in Florida, Ultrafast System. Um, what is important for pump and probe? Uh, you need to have a very stable amplifier. As I mentioned, uh, the pump is typically uh, the output of the amplifier into an OPA so that you have some level of tunability if you want to match it with the electronic properties of your sample. Sometimes you use the second harmonic generation, so at about 400 nanometer, or sometimes even the UV if you have, especially if you're studying small molecules, organic molecules. It's very important to have a stable system 
and here is a spectrum. This is an interesting, was a case study from a, a group at Polytechnic of Milano, um, where they look at the uh, stability of the white light from an amplifier over a period of 14 hours at various wavelengths here. And here actually you see uh, in pseudo color the stability of the various uh, wavelength here. The blue means that the stability measure was on the order of 0.2% RMS. That is perfectly suitable for this type of pump and probe experiment. Um, so just to give an idea, how are these experiments conducted? Uh, with the TISAF, typically one kilohertz, maybe five kilohertz, and with pulses between 25 and 100 femtosecond. And with the terbium, uh, typically 100 kilohertz, and the pulse duration is a little longer because it's determined by the physics of the terbium amplifier. Now, pump and probe can be done in a lab. It can be done also in a large facility, like uh, this is uh, the accelerator, three electron laser actually in Pohang in Korea where you see actually amplifier in this case actually are our Korean, our coherent amplifier. I was lucky to go to this installation. Uh, the lasers are actually in a separate room, but their beam are brought in through these vacuum tubes uh, where there is a remote compressor. Here there is a, a hollow fiber compressor to basically broaden and, uh, and uh, decrease the pulse duration to five femtosecond. Uh, and here is a sample chamber uh, where there is also a soft X-ray beam coming from the free electron laser. So you see the complexity of this type of setup. Now, if you go back from this complex setup to a more conventional laboratory, the other technique I want to mention is the so-called sound frequency generation at surfaces and interfaces. This is very useful to study the property at, again, at interfaces. And uh, for example, for the physics of catalyst, uh, the way this is done is that uh, um, you take advantage of the fact that at the surface or interface, you can combine beams that have some generation, which is, is basically it's uh, the, the non-degenerate case of, of second harmonic generation. And uh, this light actually represents the physical property of the chemistry at the interface. To do this study, you need to have typically a visible laser beam, femtosecond, and you need to have also a, a mid-IR beam. Now, one of these two beams has to be picosecond. And why is that? Because you are mostly study vibrational. And so to have a sufficient spectral resolution, you want to have a narrower bandwidth from the laser. So you do that in various methods. Uh, one is simple, and you see it here. It's a femtosecond amplifier pumping an OPA. Here you get this way the mid IR beam to study uh, the, the surface. And the other beam in this case is the 800 nanometer beam from the amplifier is turned into a picosecond beam through an etalon. So you narrow the bandwidth. In doing so, you throw away some energy, but it's actually a very simple way to do that. Once you do that, you can actually study uh, the properties at the surfaces. In this case, is a study of uh, 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 carbon uh, oxide molecules absorbed on a palladium surface with magnesium oxide. And these are studied for different concentration uh, of the catalyst, uh, different pressure, I think, also. And uh, you see here, basically, the SLG signal uh, as a function of the wavelength or the wave number. I mentioned before that picosecond is important. I should also emphasize that there are two types of systems that can be used. One is uh, um, picosecond using uh, uh, TISAF. Or the other one is even longer picosecond from a YAG laser. You can see here that the YAG laser gives a slightly better resolution if you compare this peak versus this peak. The disadvantage is that these lasers are typically lower repetition rate, so 10 hertz, while with a TISAF you can operate instead at a kilohertz and acquire data more rapidly. Now, uh, I would like to move from these to ultra-fast Raman spectroscopy, um, which is an important technique as well uh, to study a variety of, of molecules. One first flavor, which is uh, uh, Picosecond uh, Raman pump and probe was developed in the early 90s. Here is a sample work by Tahar and Hamaguchi in, in Japan, where uh, they can measure the Raman signature of excited states. Um, so basically, it's a pump and probe experiment. Here you can see pictorially on the other slide of side of the slide, where you use a picosecond pump and a picosecond probe, and then you measure 
uh, the spontaneous Raman emission here. Now, an interesting trick uh, to achieve femtosecond resolution on the lifetime of these states and still using uh, uh, the picosecond resolution is the so-called uh, femtosecond stimulated Raman spectroscopy, where you actually stimulate downward the Raman emission rather than waiting for the spontaneous decay. And when you do that, actually, you can use shorter duration probes. And here you see an example of this from one of the early works by Mattis in Berkeley in 2003. Uh, this is a little small, but if you can see uh, the time scale of this spectra is with a delay of hundreds of femtoseconds rather than the picosecond that you see here. Now, this is a relatively difficult technology. Uh, we'll learn more about this next week at the conference in Long Beach, the, the ICORS conference on Raman spectroscopy, where there are a lot of talks about that. Here you see two implementation. Um, one is to use a femtosecond laser, but using a special device, which is called a second harmonic bandwidth compressor. And this enables generation of picosecond pulses. And this is actually a study, uh, is a CARS study of combustion. And this is an interesting setup where the femtosecond laser is used to generate a super continuum very close to the sample. In this case, it's a combusted gas. And uh, so both the pump and the stokes are in femtosecond, very broad bandwidth. And the probe pulse at 400 nanometer is instead in the picosecond regime, guaranteeing therefore the resolution. Uh, this is another setup when more conventionally the picosecond is achieved through a slit, like I showed before in case of SFG. And the two other pulses are uh, 35, so very short femtosecond to achieve the temporal resolution. Similar complexity is a 2D spectroscopy. Uh, in 2D spectroscopy, the idea is to study not only the absorption levels uh, that are from the fundamental state, state, but also the relative coherence of excited level, both electronic and vibrational, and how they interact among them. Uh, so uh, this is kind of be done with linear standard spectroscopy. Um, it was developed again in the 90s, I think, by Robin Oxtrasser and before him by Noda in Japan, if I remember correctly. And uh, it's, uh, it's a very powerful technique. It's uh, it provides information on the dynamics of local environment of molecules or the interaction of excited electronic and vibrational state. Uh, it's used a lot, for example, for study on uh, uh, photosynthesis and the photosynthetic complexes. It's difficult because it requires a series of pulses. And again, here I should apologize. I'm an engineer, I'm not a chemist, so I don't know personally all the detail of this type of experiment. But I would say it is uh, very intensive from a point of view of uh, the implementation. Here you see, for example, a train of pulse, four pulses that need to be adjusted with interferometric uh, stability. So you have delay line with a stability, uh, a geometrical stability of 10 nanometers. So you can imagine how taxing is this. And here is an example of, of uh, this type of spectra that you uh, can achieve. And here there are a function of the temperature of the sample and also as a function of the time where the time is the waiting time uh, in the series of pulses. So basically you study the you create a coherence between excited states and you study the decay of this coherence uh, as a function of, of the delay of the waiting time. Now, this is a daunting complexity. Um, a way of decreasing the complexity was developed, I would say 10 years ago, something like that. Uh, an approach that actually is becoming popular is to use instead a, a pulse shaper to create artificially this train of pulses. And this will be, uh, for example, an acoustic optic modulator, traveling wave type. Um, this actually has been done so well, uh, developed initially by Marty Zahn in Wisconsin. Uh, it was so successful that he started his company, which is called FaceTech, and makes these uh, commercial devices that are quite flexible. They can be used uh, for uh, 2D spectrometry, but also for conventional pump and probe in a variety of regimes. This implementation uh, can be also brought to the extreme case. Uh, I was mentioning before study on photosynthesis. Uh, Jennifer Gilvey here in Michigan, she used a dazzler for providing the pulse sequence. Uh, the dazzler is the brand name of one of these modulators. 
Um, and she wants to have a very broad spectrum, so she generates white light here on a sapphire plate. And you see this effect because the 2D spectrum here is asymmetric. On this side is the pump, the pump uh, beam, so to speak, through the dazzler. And here is the probe, which is very broad, and you see cover a broader range of wavelengths. Um, another implementation of that is represented here uh, and is actually for a, a, a 2D, even more complex 2D sound frequency generation, where you do a 2D study, but you need a picosecond pulse because you are studying actually the vibrational level at the, at the, at the surface of the sample. Uh, so this is actually uh, from a researcher at, in San Diego, uh, Professor Xiong. So, uh, so much for 2D spectroscopy. Uh, I move quickly uh, to terahertz generation and study. And I show this slide uh, before I really, I just want to focus, well, before we were talking about time domain spectroscopy with femtosecond lasers, so with modest energy. The moment we want to go towards pump and probe studies, you need more energy because again, you need to pump uh, the sample. So especially if you are pumping the sample in the terahertz regime, you need to have a robust energy from the terahertz beam. So there are basically two competing ways to generate powerful terahertz pulses. One is to send an amplifier into a second harmonic crystal and combine in air uh, the two beam, the second harmonic beam and the fundamental beam in, uh, in, uh, and create a plasma filament that generate actually a very broad spectrum of terahertz that can extend actually to 30, 40 terahertz. So very broad and very convenient if you want to look at many different frequencies. Uh, the other approach is uh, to focus the amplifier beam on a crystal, uh, the same crystal that is used, for example, for difference frequency generation um, in, in an OPA. Those are infrared crystal. Uh, if the pulse has a broad bandwidth, you can have actually an intrapulse DFG. So you have actually a difference frequency generation between the various spectral component of the beam from the amplifier and generates a terahertz beam where the frequency actually is the frequency difference within these uh, original uh, near IR poles. And here also you obtain a relatively broad spectrum. You see a comparison here, a spectrum through optical rectification, which is this approach, versus a spectrum through um, air plasma generation. So it's actually broader. So how you implement this? Uh, this is a first example from a group in China. This is a very flexible uh, terahertz spectrometer uh, that is used for uh, with the optical pump in the region of uh, one to 15 microns, so very broad optical pump, and terahertz probe between less than a terahertz and up to 2.5 terahertz. So this is done actually using uh, uh, optical rectification. And uh, you see that here, uh, we see this uh, uh, zinc uh, selenide uh, element here for the, for the generation of the terahertz actually of this channel. Here to give an idea of the power of uh, uh, optical rectification, you see the energy from the laser and you see that uh, with energy on the order of millijoules, you can get uh, uh, something like several microjoules of terahertz. This is substantial energy, actually. Uh, in fact, from a point of view of efficiency, you see that air plasma and optical rectification can have an efficiency of 1% or 0.1%. Or so that's quite substantial. Um, here uh, I have another example of spectroscopy. In this specific case, uh, the, uh, the generation of the terahertz was uh, uh, through air and plasma. So this was a very broad spectrum. As I promised with this technique, you see that is extend. In this case, the amplitude spectrum was, uh, goes up to something like 50 terahertz. So if you're interested more in this, uh, you see at the bottom of the slide, I provide actually suggestion for further readings here. These are typically either tutorial or review articles. And I think I placed a few of those uh, throughout the various uh, slides. Now we're going towards the end uh, of the presentation here. So I really thank you for your patience here and your resistance. Uh, let's move on the opposite side of the spectrum, which is uh, the ultraviolet or EUV in this case, the extreme ultraviolet. Uh, why, why is this important? 
um, is important because uh, uh, you can study uh, electron dynamics in solid state and semiconductor because you do, for example, photoelectron emission spectroscopy below the optical uh, regime or the wavelength you can achieve with optical crystals. And it's important to study, for example, further brillouin zones in some materials. And you can do pump and probe uh, with uh, uh, highly excited level also in, in atoms. Now, um, UV pulses uh, go together with, with uh, uh, attosecond. And, and why is that? Now, if you consider an 800 nanometer laser is limited by the optical bandwidth to about four or five femtosecond pulses in the most extreme cases. You can actually do trick, um, and I will show some of this trick later on, to, to reduce, to increase the bandwidth and so that the pulses can be two or three femtosecond. You, extreme UV pulses, on the other hand, have a much broader bandwidth, and this bandwidth allows actually the production of attosecond pulses. So implicitly, if you want to have attosecond pulses, you need to go into the EUV region. So it's a sort of a law of physics that brings you there. Now, how do we generate EUV? Uh, the process is a high harmonic generation in noble gases. So what's happening here, it was described very well by Paul Karkum in Canada. Um, he has a model which is called the three-step model. And basically the strong field from the femtosecond pulses, and we're talking about 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14 watt per, per uh, square centimeter, pushes electrons away from the individual atoms. Very far away, actually. As this electron recombines with the atom after a very long path in acquiring also kinetic energy, they generate a series of harmonics. And you see that here in this harmonic, discrete harmonic spectrum. There are various ways, uh, various implementation. You can do a gas jet, or you can fill with gas a waveguide, or you can do a cell where you have instead a longer and uh, not a strong focusing. Various teams prefer different approaches of their choices. So a typical uh, experiment uh, where you have 800 nanometer pump and an EUV probe, and this is not necessarily at a second, but just EUV, is where you have, uh, um, you have the uh, Tysaf laser uh, going focus on a gas cell. Here you generate the EUV. Uh, you need to filter out, usually with some metal filters, the visible, and you need to use optics only in, uh, in uh, um, uh, refract, um, reflection uh, at grating angle because of the wavelength. In this experiment, of course, they have to be done in vacuum. In the meantime, you have the delay stage to, to delay the arrival of uh, uh, the pump uh, versus uh, the, the probe beam. And you do your experiment, of course, in vacuum. Now, interestingly enough, there is a lot of work on generation of EUV. And uh, uh, I just show here an interesting work from the uh, group of uh, Henry uh, Captain and Margaret Murnane. It's, it's a 12 year old work. They studied how you generate EUV depending on the uh, wavelength that you use to excite the sample in various gases like helium on the red curve or neon on the green one. And the interesting point is that the shorter is the wavelength of the laser, actually the longer is the wavelength of the exciting laser, the shorter is the EUV you can generate. This seems very paradoxical, um, but it goes with the trajectory uh, that is imparted on the electron. And that goes well beyond today's webinar. But the interesting thing is that TISAF laser is not necessarily the best tool if you want to get very short UV close to the so-called uh, uh, water windows, um, which is, uh, which is in, in, in this region here. Um, and, uh, oh, uh, actually, sorry, uh, it's, I, I, the wrong axis here. So if you want to generate uh, EUV in the water window, you have to go with long wavelets, like 1.3 uh, uh, micron through an OPA or even 4, four micron. The disadvantage here is that the conversion to this wavelength uh, is at a loss of energy, of available pump power or pump energy. And also the energy, uh, the process of high harmonic generation when it's stimulated by longer wavelength is way less efficient. The efficiency decreases with something like one to the, uh, ten to, um, a factor um, uh, between two and five order of magnitude. So there is a trade-off between 
what higher, what uh, how short UV you want to generate, and uh, and uh, uh, what efficiency uh, or low efficiency you can afford. So in general, titanium sapphire uh, with post duration shorter than 50 femtoseconds are the ideal tool. You can generate also UV with ethereum if you want to operate at 100 kilohertz, uh, but here you need somewhat higher energy and then there is the problem of getting short pulses. You really need something like 50 femtoseconds and since ethereum amplifiers cannot do that, there is a need for some uh, pulse shortening uh, technique. Now, um, I will give now some idea of these uh, uh, pulse shortening. Uh, and before that, I just want to connect, to bring a connection uh, uh, between the EUV and the attosecond pulses. Um, I mentioned before that attosecond pulses can only be in the EUV uh, because they need to support the, the necessary bandwidth. And uh, uh, in general, if you generate a UV pulse uh, from a titanium sapphire amplifier, like the one I showed before, what you get is, is a bunch uh, of pulses uh, that can be on the attosecond time frame, but uh, are in the envelope of the pulse of the titanium sapphire laser, so about 30 or 40 femtoseconds. If you want a stable a single attosecond pulse, you have to do two things. You need to shorten the pump pulse to about 5 femtoseconds, and you need also to stabilize the relationship between the optical carrier, in this case of the titanium sapphire laser, and the envelope of the pulse. This is so, the so-called carrier to envelope uh, phase stabilization. So let's first look how to get very short pulses. Uh, a way to do that is to use uh, cell phase modulation in gases, again, so similar to high harmonic generation, but not pushing it so hard. So when you do that, um, and uh, uh, this is an example, actually the very first work, uh, that's particularly dear from me because it's from people from my same school in Milan. So all people, one of them was my professor actually. So I'm quite attached to that also uh, personally. And this is an example of how they were able to broaden uh, the spectrum here, dashed line of a TISAF after this hollow fiber uh, to broaden it to in the most extreme case uh, to, to, to cover here very broad uh, region here. Um, and this is compressible with the appropriate tool using either prism or negative dispersion mirrors to five femtoseconds or something like that. Now the good news is this type of setup, uh, if you don't know how to build it, can be also purchased. Uh, for This is an example from a small company in Canada, Few Cycle. They can do this system, uh, this hollow fiber setup. And if you want to do also the, the recompression and the measurement of these pulses, uh, there is also another small company, this is in Portugal actually, and they provide uh, this technology in actually in a, in a compact box. And, and so you see that there is a sort of uh, democratization, maybe not in the cost, but in terms of how easily you can get to this very complex uh, setup. So the more difficult part is the stabilization of the carrier and the envelope, because when you have these very short pulses of five femtoseconds, you have a few cycles in that pulse, maybe three or four cycles. And how you stabilize them? Because uh, regularly they would behave like this. The optical carrier would shift from pulse to pulse because of the difference between group and phase velocity, right? So the way to stabilize this was developed by Hans uh, in, in Germany and other, uh, and this is what earned him actually the Nobel Prize in 2005. So you see many Nobel Prize actually in this presentation. And the way to do that was basically to, to uh, interfere a, a, a wavelength generated by the laser with the second harmonic uh, of the same laser um, but to do that, to make this interference, you need to have a very broad bandwidth laser. And so what you can do is you can generate, for example, through a super continuum, a broad spectrum, and then you can beat one part of the spectrum with the second harmonic of the laser itself. Or alternatively, you can do a second harmonic of the comb itself, like in this image. And when you beat these two frequency, you can actually find the so-called frequency CEO which basically would be the 
frequency, the closest frequency to the zero frequency, if you imagine that you back propagate this comb of modes equally spaced back to an imaginary zero frequency. I know this is a little bit complex, but when you do that, actually you can fix the relationship here. And when you do that, you can generate the isolated attosecond pulses. Now the level of this stability is measured in uh, phase and in milliradians. So a modern setup like this is actually from Coherent, which is one of the only two players, I think, in, the, in this type of CEP stabilization. Uh, we measure the stabilization of the oscillator is in the order of 50, millisecond, uh, 50 milliradians and uh, the stabilization on the amplifier, which over a few hours is on the order of 200 milliradians. And, uh, and users tell us that this is actually pretty much a gold rule for a long-term attosecond experiment to have a stability of 200 milliradians or less. Now with this, we are really at the end of the presentation. I just want to mentioned that we talk so far about uh, uh, performances and extreme performances. Uh, there is a push, especially on the mature technology like titanium sapphire, of uh, going towards reliability also in order to maintain the performance stable over a long period of time. And one of the efforts in the industry and specifically at Coherent is to do a series of tests on our devices where we uh, basically put the amplifiers, some of them even running, like in this case, we put them in a chamber, you see here the beam actually, and uh, we vibrate the chamber while we change the temperature very drastically by something like uh, 20 or 30 degrees C over a period of a minute or so. And this type of testing actually ensured uh, weeding away the facts and also reliability during the shipment when you know shipment sometimes is a traumatic event for a laser and also uh, when the system is installed at the customer so to conclude uh, i would say that i hope i was able to demonstrate that ultra fast lasers are a key tool for a very large application which is advanced neuroscience and biology um, there is a the same laser and especially actually amplified lasers uh, are used for an incredibly broad spectrum of experiment that in many cases can be reconducted to the scheme of pump and probe with various variations and covering an incredible spectrum of uh, wavelength or energy from the x-rays in the case of free electron lasers to the terahertz on tabletop setup. We see an increased interest in study focus on advanced solid state materials, for example, nanomaterials, two dimensional materials, or material for harvesting of energy like photovoltaics, superconductors, advanced semiconductors, or catalysts. So everything basically that actually help us, uh, you know, to be more efficient in energy, to be more efficient in physical processes or chemical processes. Interestingly enough, these materials actually are best studied with uh, relatively lower energy and higher repetition rate. And so this goes along the trend uh, towards uh, amplifiers at higher repetition rate, while a lot of the activity for high field, like with free electron lasers, or where you need high energy, like attosecond physics, will still remain the domain, domain of uh, titanium sapphire uh, technology. And with this, I, I really want to thank you very much for uh, uh, enduring uh, this presentation. Maybe it was longer than what you were expecting and what I was expecting too. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marco, for a wonderful talk. Uh, in fact, every time I listen, I feel like I have to read a lot. And it le looks like uh, this whole webinar went so fast and uh, Time was very short, in fact, and I know you're already running in the midnight, close to midnight when you're doing it. There are a lot of questions which has come up in the chat yes. box, but yes. uh, I will just take two, three questions alone to you. Sure, and, I'm happy to do that. Yes. Okay, so the first question, what I have here is, can we trap and manipulate the nanoparticles, biological samples by using ultra-fast laser? If yes, is it similar to optical tweezers or any other? If no, the reason, please. This question is from Dr. M. Baskaraya. Ah, okay, okay, thank you. Well, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, we have a number of our lasers that are used uh, as uh, optical tweezers, uh, 
uh, let me see. I'm still, uh, maybe I should stop sharing. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, the screen has been stopped. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry, I didn't realize that. Okay. Um, I'm not directly conversant with our lasers, our femtosecond laser also being used for the trapping part at this point. Um, in every situation where they were used on a single, well, on a neuron, the neuron was already there in the structure. So they were, there was no need to stabilize. Uh, interestingly enough, it's not like a, tweezer, but interestingly enough, when you do this experiment on live animal, it's very important uh, to take care of, of sealing in place or blocking in place the element, because even the breathing of the animal actually moves the neurons, right? Uh, or the heartbeat even. Um, but again, you, you don't do that with tweezer, you do it with mechanical way. So um, I'm sorry, I don't think I can answer your, from my experience, I'm not familiar with using femtosecond laser for, for the tweezer part. So we can reply him on the email. So I have the email IDs from them, so we can ask them. I have more questions with the email. Sure. Okay, I have one more question, uh, which I thought I'd take this up. Can we use these femtosecond and picosecond lasers for the lips? What are the advantages and disadvantages? These high energy will produce plasma on the sample surface as appended nanosecond laser. This is a query from Darshit. Yes, so for lips. Yeah. You yeah, have actually, lasers for lips. Yeah. Yes, yes. Actually, we, we had an example of that. Um, I don't have it here in, in, uh, in front of me, but um, there was an interesting experiment, actually, uh, lips or similar to lips, where one of our chameleon laser was put actually in the, uh, uh, in the Antarctic cycle, cycle to study actually uh, pollution levels. Uh, using uh, using lips, uh, and uh, in this case, it was a build. A resonant cavity was built to do this experiment in order to increase the sensitivity, also considering the lower energy of of the femtosecond pulses. So the answer is yes. There are a few experiments, uh, to my knowledge, that were done with this modality. I I'll take one, put you one last question, but there I see you, a customer having a raised hand. I will allow. Ask Ankit to allow him to be staying for long. Uh, so, can a laser be used in molecular dynamics? What sort of lasers? Molecular dynamics? Yeah. Well, I think uh, uh, there is a, um, a group, is uh, uh, um, Dwayne, uh, Dwayne Miller, right, which is, uh, I think, has labs both in Germany and Canada and also Rupert Huber, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, they actually do what they call molecular movies uh, of basically molecular dynamics using, uh, uh, using uh, pump and probe. So I would say it's a femtochemistry type of uh, experiment. So yes, it's, it's done. So I will request Ankit, can you please allow uh, Dr. Rajendra Prasad? Doctor, yeah. Uh, he's been raising his hand, so I will Rick, I will allow him to ask his questions directly. Dr. Rajendra Prasad? Yes. Yeah, this is uh, Dr. Rajendra Prasad. Am I audible? Yes. 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 Oh, I am working in NARL, Department of Space. Uh, it is very excellent talk and uh, I'm looking for high energy lasers but uh, it is all molecular based and very uh, low level and it is very um, inside the body, inside the molecules like that. So I don't have any much information and I want to just thank you all. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, very much. you thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, it's, it's a pleasure. And, and uh, you know, again, I don't pretend to be an application expert. I, I would say that what I was trying to do was to connect laser development with applications. So I hope it was useful. Thank you, sir. Ankit, uh, is Dr. Sayan Sen? There was a raised hand. No, he is not there now. I think okay. uh, he disconnected. Or okay. So uh, since, since the timing is short, so what I would request the audience, please uh, put your e uh, questions on an email. Uh, we will try to get all the answers done for you uh, in the coming days. And also as announced by our team, uh, whoever is interested in an e-certificate 
we want to issue the e-certificate, please uh, fill out your forms, uh, which is being sent in the link. Uh, and uh, Ankit and Apeksha will do the need for you. And uh, I, I thank you, Dr. Aragoni. Marco, it was an excellent talk. And now uh, I request the vote of thanks to be given by Dr. Balit Kumar, our managing director. Hi, so good morning to all and good evening to you, Marco. So first of all, thank you very much for this uh, excellent talk. I think uh, this is a vast number of uh, applications which Marco Arigoni has tried to cover from biology to spectroscopy to auto science and uh, <clears throat> multi-photon imaging. So there is a large number of uh, applications and I am sure that when I looked at the list of the audience, it looks like uh, there are many people from uh, different uh, uh, domain of ultrafast spectroscopy. So I am sure that uh, all of you must have at least got something of your interest. Of course, uh, there is one thing which uh, is still missing on the ultrafast side, and uh, I always uh, want uh, that somebody should also talk on the laser micro machining, and maybe because ultrafast lasers are also used now a lot for micro machining applications of metals and non-metals, and this is something uh, I would like uh, maybe just this to organize another webinar because that's a very vast topic and uh, no, vast number of applications which interest uh, scientific as well as uh, industrial uh, areas and many, many <clears throat> laboratories are doing that kind of work and many industries are now adopting ultrafast microscopy. So thank you, Marco Arigoni for this excellent talk. Uh, I can only say that uh, I know Marco since the day one when you joined uh, Coherent, because I myself uh, was associated with Coherent since 1984. And 1988, actually, when I started uh, laser science, Marco joined in the same year. So right. we know each other very well, and we have uh, been meeting on many, many different uh, platforms in the sales meetings and some technical discussions and some conferences and have been exchanging a lot of uh, ideas, new applications uh, and things like that. And I should say that Marco has become more like a professor now. So he's, <laughs> he's really a good teacher and the, the way he explained all the applications is uh, very elaborative and I'm sure that audience must have got benefited by that. I also thank all the audience. I could see about 145 participants, of course, with some variations, so maybe even more. And this is definitely a large number, and I am quite encouraged that so many people could attend to this, even though they are early hours of the morning. And when I was screening the list of the participants, I could see there are many participants from some Western countries as well. So that means that they must be really getting up very early to listen to Marco. So I, I, I believe that they must have probably heard Marco Arigoni somewhere else. So they were eager to hear him again, even though it was very early for them. So thank you very much, all the audience. And thank you, Jagdish, as a moderator, to conduct this webinar very efficiently. Thank you, other panel members, to do efficient work, my marketing team, uh, HR, Ankit, everybody. I was also seeing in the chat box, there are many questions which have been raised and several of them were also on Raman spectroscopy, particularly related to ultrafast Raman spectroscopy. Uh, I know that we cannot cover all the questions here during this uh, session, but uh, we would like to take up uh, the answers to your questions uh, by emails. And those who have not shared email addresses, please share them. Uh, as early as possible, and we will find the answers to your queries and communicate to you. So, thank you very much, uh, everybody. Once again, thank you. 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 Bye. Thank you. Uh, Ankit, we can close the session. Okay. Thanks, Ankit. Thanks. Uh, Thanks everyone.
Uh, Chaitanya, you would like to wait for some more Google Forms? You have, you have given to everyone. 